Psychonauts! Hmm, bacon. When it comes to storytelling, Psychonauts is, um, what's the, uh, objective technical term here? Oh yeah. So freaking good. I'm not just talking about the plot, the sense of humour, the wonderfully bonkers design, or the milkman, us gamers, huh? What I love about Psychonauts is how it all comes together. That which seems like complete chaos is part of a controlled vision, of simple ideas that build to unobtrusive complexity. Every element of the game's design is in support of each other, and while it's certainly, a uh, rough around the edges, oh dear, there's loads to learn from how it's made. I am a grieving widow. I see that you are grieving. I will give you your space. On a recent playthrough, I was reminded of something Matthew Matosis said about the concept of a skill ceiling and a skill floor. These refer to the complexity of game mechanics. A high skill ceiling means there's opportunity for an advanced player to invest in the controls and pull off a complex style of play, while a low skill floor means anybody can pick up the game and have an enjoyable time. It is possible to have only a high floor or a low ceiling, but it is also possible for both to be equally far apart, allowing a broader audience the opportunity to make as much or as little of the mechanics as they want. I believe the same thing exists creatively, that you can accommodate different levels of contextual investment in the same manner. A simple story can lay a strong foundation for narrative clarity and lead to great complexity. Audience members can follow the story and grapple with the immediate action and characters, but those looking for more may be able to interpret a work's message or discover detail that gives the material new meaning. Hulk, Hulk, Hulk the difference in a game is that it's theoretically less linear. You are the one pushing the character to discover that detail. Sometimes they'll just shove it in your face, make you eat it, but it is possible on occasion for it to be your choice how far to reach in to discover something. Hopefully it's benign. In many platformers, what you see is what you get. Back in the day, mascot appeal took priority over justification. Any branding was a company calling card in a sea of products. The more technology has improved and the popularity of video games has grown, the more justification we found being given to their narratives, especially when we moved into the third dimension. This, early on, was still effectively window dressing, and that's perfectly fine, but it felt like there were further opportunities to explore that through the game's mechanics. It's different to say, a point and click adventure, where the player is tasked with being invested in the context so they can solve the mysteries presented, based on observational skills. Their grasp of the story, their patience, or their general curiosity can even lead to them finding information other players might miss and have a different impact on their experience. Essentially, the option is there for them to get more invested and receive small rewards for taking notice. <laughs> Around the 2000s, there was a push for platformers to take new directions, and, maybe without fully realising, they began to explore that potential. It's kind of a natural next step. Platformers are about characters. They're designed from a third-person perspective, where we are outside of the avatar we're controlling. So, for as much as we are participating, they're based around our perception of an individual in an environment. That can lead to at least a little intrigue about their lives, their world, and their point of view. And when you lean into that, you can create a character whose way of interacting can stem from their personality or background or a world that incorporates a very distinctive rule set. It's a blend of context and function which produced games that stood out from the competition, a sign that maybe 3D platformers had something more to offer. Maybe they had something more to say. Blizzard Freedom Fighter, thank you. Yeah, maybe. This is where Psychonauts comes in. A game that realizes the potential through a low context floor and a high context ceiling. I am on the road crew. This is my stop sign. Hello fellow road crew worker. Welcome to the road crew. Developed by Double Fine, Psychonauts is a hybrid of both platforming and adventure game sensibilities thanks to the studio's pedigree. It consisted of former LucasArts employees, including Tim Schafer, a source of many of its point-and-click hits. The 3D platformer's popularity was in full swing as they thought up their first game, and had a great influence on the form it would eventually take. These two styles complement each other well. Exploring an environment, no matter the genre of gameplay, lends itself to learning about its context. Making that interesting, though, relies on some world-class conceptualization. Psychonauts is a pretty simple, high-concept pitch. Psychics exist. Do you believe in mental telepathy? No, I hear you think. <laughs> People are randomly born with mental powers, like the ability to move objects or burn things or cheat at bingo. Some have been recruited by the government as a branch of secret agents, the Psychonauts, who protect the world from danger. Select members have opened a summer camp for psychic children, so they can teach them how to control their powers in a safe environment far from the normal world. One such child is Raz, a boy who ran away from his circus home to escape his superstitious family's disapproval of his abilities. He plans to train there to become a psychonaut himself, but he soon discovers there's more to the camp than meets the third eye. 
In the game, Raz can do everything you'd want a psychic to do, and that would be fun enough on its own, but the kicker is that, via an official psychonaut technique, you can also travel into the minds of others and explore their thoughts made manifest. This forms the basis of the major levels in the game, stages designed around the individual's personality or point of view. It starts with the psychonauts themselves as you partake in camp classes, but eventually you enter the minds of mental patients in an asylum across the lake, it's explained, don't worry, and use your powers to grapple with bipolar disorder, OCD, schizophrenia, paranoia, and dickhead syndrome Oh no wait, there's- I'm sorry Crispin, there's no cure. Can you back away from my elevator and die? So, there's a lot going on, but it hangs together on its starting conceit, the existence of psychics. You'll have noticed how effortlessly it segues from that ground floor pitch to runaway circus boys and mental patients and fish people. Normally these would just be cool excuses for creative stages, they wouldn't need to have a rhyme or reason to necessarily be enjoyable, but Psychonauts finds a way to fit that into its own stylized language. We know that it came from an unused idea originally intended for one of Schaefer's older games, Full Throttle, where the lead character was to take peyote and go on a psychedelic trip into his own mind. Psychedelia serves as a primordial influence, and when was Psychedelia at its height in pop culture? the 1960s. What else was going on in the 60s? The boom of Marvel Comics, which introduced us to the X-Men, teenaged outsiders trained by a teacher with psychic abilities, James Bond, a super spy who went on top secret missions to defend the world from evil masterminds, Vietnam raged on and split the country's culture, monster movie reruns, boots, skirts, park rangers, sailor, croupier, Lord Mayor's croupier. These ideas branch from one another quite naturally, sharing themes of outsiders and doubt and finding yourself, and it mirrors the discussions had by the team when they realised that it was more interesting to have a mechanic where you entered not your own mind, but the minds of others. To create empathy, the game's overall theme. I think we're at a lunch from, with friends from work, and someone said something kind of strange, and another friend just stared at them and said, what, what colour is the sky in your world? <laughs> it's just like, it's like, like, you so, saw, <laughs> like, what colour is the sky in your world? And I just kept thinking about that phrase. The consistency of the game's visual style helps codify that content into a distinct palette to paint these ideas with. Scott C., another ex-LucasArts employee and illustrator, was assigned art director and wanted to approach three-dimensional work from an illustrative angle, a feeling shared by Tim. The offbeat choices Scott makes in colour and shape are well suited to something rooted in psychedelic imagery, but also to a world about empathising with outsiders. There are nods to other popular works at the time of the same sentiment. The Nightmare Before Christmas and the popularity of Tim Burton's art stemmed from similar ideals born of loneliness and non-conformity, as well as working in that illustrative three-dimensional hybrid aesthetic they'd both been aiming for. He, when he was pitching me the game and stuff, he was talking a lot about like Rankin Bass, like stop motion stuff, you know, which is already really interesting because you're looking at like those are like, you know, 50s illustrations that they successfully turned into 3D and stuff like that. While it's got an abrasively kooky style and hard angles, the level of caricature has a use in establishing the game's tongue-in-cheek tone, befitting Tim Schafer's pointed sense of humour. You're going to touch on some darker, maybe more difficult themes, but you're also going to have it communicated through strong, identifiable stereotypes to remind you that it's not to be taken too seriously. Its broadness is a great disarming tactic that invites understanding from a general audience, who perhaps might normally shy away from these topics, laughing with the characters, and then suddenly finding themselves engaged in solving their problems. There is perhaps a danger in that, when everything in the game is stylized, then reality and the mental worlds might not seem distinct enough from each other, so avoiding that is achieved through colour and level structure. The world outside of the brains is still <laughs> yeah, this is pretty weird, but has reasonable earthy tones, as well as much more logically constructed layouts that offer a great deal of freedom and density of detail. The mindscapes have intense colour palettes, structure and focus, forming shapes that affect the way you press forward. Again, being quite literally a heightened reality means it's perfectly okay for them to go that far, making any extreme set in the game's actual reality seem tame by comparison. Appreciating the game's style makes it easier to appreciate the verisimilitude of its minutia. Pickups inside the mind are expected visual metaphors like emotional baggage, figments of the imagination, layers of astral projection. Enemies involve sensors, personal demons and nightmares, and in the real world they're represented by wildlife that's been affected by abnormal activity to become psychic themselves. The currency is part of a gag involving a camp legend. You can't go in the water because of a psychic curse on your family, something they make a point of being unavoidable compared to the other hazards. Even the sound for activating cheat codes is a creepy bit of foreshadowing about Raz's own mental health. You cheated. Any obstacle you come across tends to have a reason to be there in the form chosen, and you look at it all and you go, neat, cool, I get it, I know what those are. The broadness is helpful in distinguishing the characters you'll be keeping track of too, their outward personalities immediately apparent at a single glance, until we discover otherwise. 
Making the lead character, Raz, stand apart from them was done through a series of carefully made design choices, in spite of what you may have heard. What is the purpose of the goggles? He grew up in a circus, so he has some protective headgear as well as acrobatic abilities that make him adept at jumping around platforms. He's attending a summer camp, so he's got a little rucksack to carry his items and merit badges, which will mark new powers available to the player as you go. He wants to be a psychonaut, so of course he's gotten himself a little jacket and jumper that emulates his hero, Sasha 9. Being so full of purpose informs us of what we can do in the game, but also allows Raz not to get lost in the weirdness around him. It was an issue they found their original hero, Dart, didn't communicate very well. It's why he's been banished to the poopy toilet. Buh bye These decisions might seem restrictive, but they support the upper limits of your imagination. You can go to all these crazy places, but what good is that if you don't understand or care? That's what makes this contextual floor so important, like an incredibly sturdy trampoline that allows ideas that jump on it to reach some impressive heights, but only if you're interested. Those things aren't for everyone. I am making a pie. I hope you are not trying to steal my husband, Tramp. Optional detail thrives here. It's possible to travel through and enjoy the game's main story, but there is a huge amount of extra narrative content that can be discovered on the way to 100% and beyond. Some of it is stuff you probably know is significant and worth going back to, and others you'd have to be curious enough to seek out yourself. Even though you won't get a new rank or level out of it, you'll probably still be glad you thought to check. I'd like you to meet Mr. Pokilo. Seems like a nice turtle. You shouldn't get him involved in this mess, Raz. It's not difficult to find yourself chasing these possibilities. While Psychonauts imposes limits, it lets you explore within them freely, from physical exploration to the extent you can abuse your powers. The moveset of using your mind to lift, confuse, or burn things isn't fixed only to what a level requires. It is possible, and indeed encouraged, that you test this out on whatever seems like it might be affected. And yes, this will get some reactions. I will take out your intestines, fry them in the hash browns. Most fun and relevant to the ideal of engendering some kind of empathy is the clairvoyance ability. When using this, you can see yourself from another person's point of view, and it works on just about every character and enemy. You can finally see what people really think of you, even the squirrels. How horrifying. Interaction is flexible, and anything from burning to simply talking to a person can lead you to a new discovery. But sometimes the information you're missing doesn't have to be dragged out of a character's mouth. Psychonauts features what I can only describe as a series of tableaus, big and small, littered throughout its design that, on further inspection, explain much about the characters. These feature heavily in the brain levels, and has the effect of what you think travelling through someone's thoughts might be like. Most of this is just functional gimmicks to justify you getting around the space, but every now and then you'll come across aspects that represent either very specific memories or that person's thought process, offering clues that say, hey, there's a bit more going on here, or maybe it's just weird. See this room? Okay, you can shrink down and go inside the, the board. See that window? I think about this a lot. It makes full use of the staging offered through the medium, like how a repressed memory can be represented by a hidden or difficult to reach section. I'm starting to feel like I'm back in high school, which is weird because I'm only 10. Great way to utilize that whole spatial awareness thing that the 3D platformer gives us, you know, right? Whoa! The most literal and highly talked of items supplying that context are the memory vaults. These are creatures hidden in the levels containing slides that depict, wordlessly, significant events in the life of the person whose mind you're visiting. They are, again, optional outside of achieving 100%, but they put the game's story and characters in a new light. The smart thing is that they're not arbitrarily placed in a level. If a memory vault is easy to find, chances are that memory is something the person doesn't mind you seeing, but another may be blocked or further out of the way to signify the host's attempt to suppress it. Few can forget stumbling into the hidden room in Mia's mind as she suddenly chips in to try and warn us off. This room's no fun. Let's leave, baby. Now you definitely don't want to go in there. Why did you let us hide? Again. The impact of moments like this benefits greatly from the fact that it's incidental. It's that old rule of show, don't tell. What a person says may not be what we discover in their mind, putting the power of the story in the hands of the player. This is particularly useful once you get to the batch of brains beyond the teachers, the aim of the level being to try and help that person resolve their traumas. The more you know about the level, the more you're learning about the character and their view of the world. The shape of the game means that different sections elicit different approaches in storytelling. Mental worlds are heavily focused on the individual, but the hub worlds dive on world building and keep the bigger picture of your goals in sight. You'll learn things about the plot in places you probably didn't expect, and at certain points it may be possible to connect the dots and make what might seem random suddenly quite significant. See how pretty my eggs are. 
There is another sizable chunk of story that takes place in this manner. Your fellow summer camp cadets all have stories of their own, but it's entirely possible to complete the game having never known so. They serve a role in the main story representing general life in the camp, and why Raz is a special case in comparison to them. There are a few recurring B-plot kids who get a chance to show their attitudes in the gameplay, like Bully Bobby Zilch, who serves as a minor obstacle in two of the levels, and the nervous Dogen, who Raz has to guide through a minefield in the first stage. Others just lend some nice textures to the game's sense of humour and set up early on the tone of the journey you've just begun. If you do some detective work at different points of the game, however, you'll discover that each kid is going through their own personal journey and finding themselves, the way kids do at summer camp. I never did that. They can be found hanging around, sometimes by themselves or with each other, and paying attention can lead you on to where they might turn up next. There's a payoff if you find yourselves interested in those stories. Halfway through, their brains are snatched by the villain, and you can choose to seek them out as you make your way up the abandoned asylum tower. Collecting a brain puts the respective kid back in the camp and allows you to observe their last actions before the story ends. It puts me in mind of something Majora's Mask was good at, creating a small community that was active without your input, and who, after your involvement, have their lives knowingly improved inside of the game in real time. And for a bit anyway. This kind of thinking extends to the mindscapes. After completing them, the hosts will react when you travel back, mostly to let you know that your actions had an effect, but sometimes to justify what they're up to currently, depending on where they are in the story. I think I need to focus on main Maintaining some level of brain activity. Ooh, I can help with that. Let me shoot up the place. It's not a huge change, but it's quite a satisfying signal of progress. Now, of course, while it's nice to make that optional, many might argue that this is a large amount of work for elements that may never be seen. In my first playthrough all those years ago, so much of it flew by, and I certainly didn't keep good enough track of where everything was. Even then, however, you knew something else was there. The benefit of this kind of set dressing is that even if you aren't participating fully, it makes the game feel rich with activity. That there might be a surprise waiting for you if you decide to go off script. They've raised the ceiling for many eventualities. Give this valley an interesting history, hmm? It is this encouragement of exploration and purpose that gives the naught part of Psychonaut some serious weight. We are pulling at these threads of intuition to expand our understanding of others and how we can help them, peeking around mental corners and taking notes on their habits. It's well founded on simple ideas we can process, allowing us to step in and tackle the difficult stuff, and if we so choose, go a step beyond and tie up as many loose ends as possible with a hop, skip and a jump. From the floor to the ceiling, Psychonauts puts you on the job using as much of the medium's potential as possible. Pretty simple, but pretty complex too. Now, I may love Psychonauts and what it does, but I know it isn't the be-all, end-all of game design. It comes down to the intentions of the creator, and there are plenty of games in the genre that are abstracted or simpler or whatever that I would love to talk about here too, for just as long. Maybe longer. The reason I keep coming back to Noughts is that I've yet to play a platformer as thoroughly well thought out. I've seen many attempts to approach some of its qualities, but there's often a lack of inspired reasoning that makes me less confident in their efforts. I haven't liked everything Double Fine's produced since, or maybe even agreed with every decision made, but I see the baseline of that talent is always evident in their work. I've even seen it pay off, and it gives me the confidence that I could potentially see more great things from them in the future. Even then, because of their efforts, we have a game that I honestly think will continue to stand the test of time. For me, it defines everything I think the 3D platformer is capable of, making me care about the medium as much as it wants me to care about its story. And one can only imagine if that can happen again. Stick around, folks. I work in the sewers. Feces. Thanks for watching, everyone. My patrons are a huge part of what makes this content possible, and I'd like to thank them for helping get this year kicked off strong. If you'd like to be a part of that gang and want to see my other works, then there's a link to my Patreon and my videos coming right up. I'll be talking about what I think of the sequel so far and eventually giving it a review, so stay tuned for more things that are not Sly Cooper on here. What have I got in my hand this time? <laughs> a magazine!